Today's video is partially sponsored by Outs. Outs is a growing general store, providing essential items for those out active. Their featured item, this rechargeable lighter. In case you run out of fuel, keep this around and it will solve your problem. It's windproof and comes with waterproof protection in case it gets wet. Get your rechargeable lighter. The price has dropped to $14, links in the description. Not going to waste any time in between, let's get into the story. He run it, he run it, he run it. In the mid-2000s, the Marmot Coat became popular in New York City. It had been around back in the 90s, and some of the dealers and more privileged people had the luxury of owning one. Now, as far as the 2000s, initially, you would have some of these marmots, or merms as they called them, which people were being robbed for. Eventually, they would become more affordable, being more obtainable for less fortunate individuals. It would even the plain field for a while and things would die down for a minute. As always, something must fill the void. Some people have the need to stand out, stunt, or let material items prove their value. Sometime, it's just a hard worker trying to treat themselves to a little something nice. One thing we know is that the perception is that when you're wearing what's trending, you're in and will have a perceived status as such. When you get into it like that in the poor neighborhoods though, you're a come up and the wolves want to eat. So, back to the biggie specifically. Approaching the turn of the decade, the biggie model had gained traction. The cycle would restart and those had the money went to cop out. They were going for north of $600, and in some places, even north of 7. 2009 to 2014 would be filled with robberies all around the city surrounding these coats, especially in the Bronx and Harlem. It was a trophy to take one from a rival or bystander. In fact, during these times, only the boldest would leave their neighborhoods wearing a biggie alone. Other than that, it was mobbing, or walking around in groups, with multiple members wearing different colors of this coat, sometimes hunting for others wearing one. You would even see young people with canes and wonder, wow, how are so many young guys ending up with a Robocop foot so early in life? That was just the combo though, a biggie, and a cane, to beat people, and to support a limp from gun carrying. It was a stigma, and when you seen that, hey, get out of there. One early story to hit media happened in 2011. Three suspects from the Bronx were indicted for murder after an 18-year-old was struck by two cars trying to run away from them. After the story came out, it turned out to be a setup. Malik was 18 years old at the time when he found himself heading to the Sotomayor houses by the Bruckner Boulevard. He and a friend was basically lured over there by two females, 15 and 17 years old. Once they got to the block, they were confronted by four individuals. The friend who came with Malik had a $150 True Religion jacket on, while Malik had on his biggie. Allegedly, they took the jacket from the friend and tried to rob Jenkins too, but he broke free. He took off, running to the expressway. As he tried to cross it along Bruckner Boulevard, he was struck by two cars, a Toyota Prius and a BMW. It was said that Malik had plans to be an engineer and wrote poetry. It was unclear why three suspects had been charged when there were four men attempting to rob him, and we don't know much of what came of this case. However, this is one example of a tragic case over material. From this point, there would be other material items people were being robbed and are assaulted for. Canadian gooses, Pele Pele leathers, and monkulers. Wait, BB belts were getting snatched off too. Another story takes place two years later on the Lower East Side, commonly known as LES. By 2013, a gang called the Block Boys had influence over the culture in the Barrage Houses. The 17 buildings are bounded by East River Drive to the east, East Houston Street to the north, Columbia Street to the west, and Delancey Street to the south. At one point, they were crips and often had disputes with rival gangs, such as the Latin Kings. Raphael, aka Tokyo, 16, was affiliated with the Block Boys from the Barrage Houses. Although he was an all-star and excelled at any sport, he enjoyed playing baseball and had been a part of the boys and girls club for five years prior to his death. He played shortstop and standing six foot one, he definitely had the potential to make it to the pros. He was known to have a sense of humor, which complemented his sometime boisterous attitude. He is remembered by his tall lanky frame and his leadership qualities, setting the tone for some of those around him. In January 4, 2013. It was a Friday night when the gunman approached, causing panic among a group of people gathered in a commercial plaza. People darted off in different directions. A friend of Tokyo's, 
fled into a pizza shop and Tokyo sought shelter next door in a deli. Tokyo emerged from the store a few moments later, possibly to check the status of the gunman and whether he was still outside or not. Indeed, the gunman was outside waiting. He fired, striking Tokyo in the chest and sending him reeling back into the store. As Tokyo collapsed, he communicated to a few friends inside the store, indicating that the person who shot him might have wanted to steal his jacket. The teen was rushed to Beth Israel Hospital, but declared dead on arrival. He was the first youth murdered in the city that year. Police said an investigation was ongoing. Others who were gathered at the store on Saturday wondered whether the shooting could have stemmed from a beef between Barrich projects and the nearby Rias houses. Apparently that had been some recent static and a fight had broke out a few days prior to the shooting. Days later, at least three separate fights erupted outside the province on a lands a funeral home on 2nd Avenue, where hundreds of friends and relatives had gathered to mourn the slain teen. A few young dudes started tussling with each other outside the funeral doors, with one teen screaming, he shouldn't be here, he shouldn't be here. Several young women, sobbing hysterically, tried to break up the scuffle, but the fight spilled into the street and momentarily stopped traffic as police flooded the scene. The argument broke up, but then restarted a couple blocks away on Tosta Street, and then another scuffle started in front of the funeral home later. Allegedly, during the fights, someone was beat with a chain, as well as a frying pan. The first alleged thug busted claimed that all he did was supply the gun. I saw the guy shoot the kid, Timothy Montalvo, 16, said of the January 4 fatal shooting of Tokyo in front of a church at 49 Columbia Street. Tokyo resisted demands to relinquish the $600 marmot and paid with his life, cops say. Montalvo was one of four kids caught on video surveillance entering and then leaving a nearby grocery store just before the shooting. Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly said the actual shooter was identified as Walter, 20, who was still being sought. The story was that this was possible retaliation over jackets being stolen earlier that evening. Allegedly, the violent chain of events began the day of the murder, when a group of the block boys, including Tokyo, was accused of stealing a winter coat. A second group based above East Houston Street, including the cousin of the teen whose coat was swiped, came to Columbia Street with intent on stealing Tokyo's coat to get even. As far as the alleged shooter, don't know what came of him or if he was actually charged, but Montalvo was. Three years after the murder, 19 at the time, Timothy Montalvo was sentenced to 15 years to life. In November of the same year, 2013, a similar situation would take place in Midtown, involving a Bronx gang member. Corey Dunton, a member of the 5-9 Brims, was accused of opening fire at a crowded Manhattan ice skating rink, injuring two. It was the weekend, Saturday, and he had posted on social media that he was heading to the rink with an amp, which is slang for a gun. Hours after the shooting, the seemingly incriminating Facebook posts continued. As police closed in on his Bronx apartment Sunday morning, Dunton reportedly posted on Facebook, Feds at my door, I'm going out with a bang. Take my soul. The posts went on to say, Feds trying to kick down my door, it's over where, do I go from here man? Do I end my life? I don't know what to do, I effed up. After a 45-minute standoff, he was eventually apprehended at his apartment in the Hunts Point area of the Bronx. He was taken to the Midtown South Precinct House in Manhattan after he was arrested, refused to answer questions, and demanded a lawyer. At first, he said a friend did it, but when heard that someone was actually injured, he took responsibility. His mother, sick on dialysis, had to hear her son apologize and tell her loved her, as this would be the end of his foolishness on the streets. The shocking incident happened just after 11 p.m. on the skating rink in the heart of the popular Midtown Park located at 42nd Street and 6th Avenue. Dunton allegedly demanded a 20-year-old man named Contreras to give up his $600 biggie. When the man refused, investigators said Dunton left the skating rink, returned with a gun, and fired several shots into the crowd. The intended target, Contreras, was shot once in the arm, but not seriously injured. A 14-year-old bystander, identified as Mara, was shot in the back and family members said it was possible he may never walk again. Witnesses of the harrowing incident took to Twitter to share their accounts and photos from the crime scene. People just fell on the floor because they heard a gunshot and they had ice skating skates on, so they couldn't run. A witness told the New York Times he saw a man skate up to another person in the middle of the rink, pull a gun and open fire. 
In total, three shots reportedly rang out, sending park goers running for cover, some of them wearing only socks. A young woman believed to be a victim's sister was heard exclaiming, my brother just got shot in front of my face. The teenager told someone he could not feel his legs as he was lying on the ice. Early Sunday morning, Mara's numerous friends and well-wishers took to Twitter to post messages of support for the injured young man. As for Dunton, he grinned, laughed and cursed at reporters as he was led by police to a court arraignment on the following Monday evening. F all you ninjas, Corey Dunton yelled, as he was ushered into a waiting car. The shooting was reportedly over a biggie jacket. But, according to the New York Daily News, the Bronx team told reporters, smirking, it wasn't over a jacket. It was over your mother, ninja. A source with the NYPD confirmed that the intended target, Contreras, and Dunton knew each other. In February of 2017, he was sentenced to 25 year in prison. Through his time going back and forth to court, he did write a letter expressing his remorse. Apparently the death of a friend, named Cheese, contributed to his string of violence and depression. Cheese had been murdered two years earlier at a party on Bathgate Avenue. After being kicked out of the party, he was persistent in getting his $10 cover charge back. In response, he was beaten and stabbed. But with this, I wouldn't say that this specific situation is justifiable. There could be some underlying things that took place that we are not privy to as well. But this is a story of the marmot. Nowadays, cars have been more prevalent as far as robberies, and with every generations, the stakes grow higher too. Anyway, thanks for watching, and rest in peace to the young people that lose their lives in these stories. Hopefully, you don't end up on here as a victim or as the perp. If you have an issue with the content, then I hope you have an issue with the ones in your household that's contributing to the violence. Stay low, good night.